Good morning. Welcome Pennsylvania anglers and boaters and fellow commissioners and commission staff. Uh, my name is Richard Lewis and I'm honored to be the chair of Pennsylvania's Fish and Boat Commission's Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee. I'm calling this meeting to order at 10.03 a.m. The meeting is being conducted online and it's also being live broadcast in real time with the commissioners and the staff participating remotely. This session is being recorded and by participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, the retention and the use of this session. <clears throat> a, a, a recording of the committee meeting will also be available on the commission's YouTube site at a later date. I'll now conduct the committee roll call. Vice Chair Bill Brock. Bill mentioned to me that he would be joining uh, as soon as he could, but not able to join initially. Member Don Anderson. Uh, present. Thank you, Don. Member Eric Hussar. Here. Thank you, Eric. Member Rick Kaufman. Present. Thank you, Rick. Ex officio member BJ Small. Present. Thank you, BJ. I also welcome all the other non committee member commissioners joining us and let you know that you're free to, to uh, join in the discussions on this call. But uh, if any formal votes are taken and we don't expect any, you need to abstain from voting. I'll now call on the commission president, BJ Small, to lead us in the pledge of allegiance. BJ. Thank you, Richard. I pledge allegiance to the flag the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, BJ. Because this meeting is being held in a virtual format, the process for accepting public comment is a little different than an in-person meeting. Public comments pertaining to the agenda for this meeting were requested in advance and accepted by phone from Wednesday, the 21st of June at 12 p.m. until Thursday, the 22nd of June at 4 p.m. Recorded comments were limited to five minutes and they'll be presented to committee members at the beginning of the meeting. I want all of us to note at the beginning of this meeting that it's intended to be generally informational in nature and no votes are scheduled. We will start by the hearing of public comments submitted prior to the meeting and followed by presentations from the commission staff. There will be opportunities for there will be opportunities for commissioner and staff discussion following each presentation. And I ask that commissions and questions and comments be held until those times so that can, we can efficiently get through this very ambitious agenda. We have five topics on the agenda for today's meeting. These include a comprehensive summary of the proposed rule to create a new chapter of the commission's regulations aimed at aquatic invasive species prevention at fish health and stocking fish in the waters of the Commonwealth, often referred to as chapter 71A. Second agenda item will be an update on the proposed alternative management strategy for class A wild brown trout stream sections stocked with trout by the commission. <clears throat> an overview, third will be an overview of the factors and approaches that staff intend to employ to evaluate the current minimum size and daily take limit for trout under the Commonwealth's inland waters regulations. Fourth will be an overview of an emergency action that was taken on Atlantic striped bass by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and how this affects Pennsylvania anglers. And number five, last, there'll be a brief overview of the fisheries voting items that are planned for our July 2023 quarterly commission meeting. <clears throat> this is a lengthy agenda and we have a lot of detail to cover. So I'm gonna announce now that it's likely that I'll call a 10 minute bathroom or messaging break around 10 a.m. 
Richard, Richard, if I might, I just got a note that Brock is on the line. So if you want to recognize him, please. Sure, that would be good. Um, okay, we'll add to the roll call. Um, I'll, I'll call the roll for Bill Brock, Vice Chairman of the Committee. Are you present, Bill? I am present. Thank you. Thanks, Bill, and thank you for joining us. <clears throat> As usual, at a committee meeting, we normally uh, first hear public comments submitted to the commission and then move on to the staff presentations. Um, and I will note at the end of this meeting, there will be an opportunity for the commissioners to bring forward any new fisheries or hatcheries business they would like to bring up. At this time, we would normally turn the meeting over to Renee Keel, the commission's chief counsel, to read any public comments received into the record. <clears throat> but I've been, I've been advised by Renee that we have received no public comments for this session. So we will simply move to staff presentations as detailed in the agenda. The first item on the agenda is a comprehensive presentation from Bob Cassis, Director of Policy Planning and Communications, Koja Yamashita, Fish Health Unit Leader, and Dave Nyhart, who's our Fisheries Management Division Chief. These, these pres this presentation will be regarding the proposed rule to create a new chapter, Chapter 71A of the Commission's regulations aimed at aquatic invasive species prevention at fish health and at stocking fish in the waters of the Commonwealth. We'll first hear, hear from Bob and he will subsequently turn the microphone over to the other two staff presenters. So Bob, I'll turn the meeting over to you now, please proceed. Thank you, Chairman, and good morning, everybody. Uh, again, this presentation is going to focus on the commission's creation of a new chapter in its regulations, as uh, the chairman had mentioned, Chapter 71A. And what I'm going to be doing today is giving an overview of what we're trying to accomplish, as well as some uh, changes to the language in response to stakeholder and public comment feedback. After that, I will turn things over to Koja to talk about fish health and then subsequently to Dave on the uh, stocking aspects. So 10,000 foot level, you know, right now in our regulatory code, we have chapters 71 and 73. And those two chapters were first created again in the 1980s. And they address a number of topics, notably the introduction and transportation of fish into the Commonwealth, but again, there's also other things in there, uh, such as fish health, a prohibited species list, uh, propagation language, etc. And again, since the 80s, there have been amendments that have occurred to both chapters, uh, most recently 2018, but in discussions, uh, we feel that a rewrite of both into a single chapter for efficiency and, and getting up at the current times is best. So again, just a brief overview of what we have on the books right now and what we're and where we're trying to go. Next slide, please. So why the purpose for the rewrite? And, and there's a number of things, but notably and at the forefront, it's addressing aquatic invasive species and disease vectors in the Commonwealth and, and trying to prevent both of those. Uh, on the same token, we want to make sure we have healthy fisheries here in the Commonwealth. And again, in line with more of the aquatic invasive species topic, you know, right now we don't have watercraft inspection requirements here in PA. And, and when I say watercraft inspection requirements, making sure that you know, there's you know, no standing water in a kayak or canoe or a boat as, as you're driving away from a boat launch that may you know, have, uh, for instance, you know, zebra mussels or pathogens in it, as well as, a, you know, vegetation such as hydrilla, uh, taking it from one water body to another. So trying to put that in place and, and again, improve our understanding and management of the fisheries here in the Commonwealth. You know, notably in the U.S., there's over 30 states that have some sort of requirement uh, for tracking how and when fish are stocked in state waters. And, and notably, at least for the states in the Northeast, we are the only one that doesn't have any paper trail in place for tracking. Um, you know, again, from the fish health perspective, we're trying to prevent new pathogens from coming into the Commonwealth, as well as mitigating the spread of those that are existing in 
Pennsylvania at the moment. And as I mentioned before, just a, again, the creation of watercraft inspection requirements, at least 19 other states in the US have something like that in place already. So again, this is really aimed at the aquatic uh, resource conservation and, and preventing aquatic invasive species. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to do was just give a few examples um, to, to show exactly, you know, what we're trying to address and, you know, zebra mussels, right? They're <clears throat> known to be in Lake Erie, but they were discovered in Racetown Lake in 2021, most likely from a contaminated boat. Uh, but again, once those get into a water body, they're really, really hard and, and almost impossible to, to get out completely. Uh, white perch, for instance, is a species that will outcompete native species uh, for, for food and habitat, for instance, in that type of uh, lake habitat. Another example would be you know, flathead catfish in the Susquehanna and Delaware River basins. Uh, they're known to prey upon uh, shad as they're trying to migrate up uh, you know, through the, the Delaware River, for instance, and, and that's an example where you have Again, an invasive species preying on a, on a native species that the commission is trying to restore. Uh, you know, gill lice and trout, that is a parasite that does attach to the gills of trout and can make it difficult for, you know, if, if there's enough that attach on uh, for breathing. And, and again, getting potentially into wild populations. So that's something that we're keeping an eye on and trying to address. Uh, there's the you know the risk of escapement from private ponds. Uh, if you have a pond starter kit and there's been known to have invasive species in there, one of which, uh, you know, for instance, a Chinese mystery snail, uh, they have been <clears throat> known to go from a pond into a carrier fish stream and then getting into uh, other streams nearby. And then lastly, you know, from a fish community perspective, it's really making sure if we're rebuilding fish communities in reservoirs that have been drained and being filled, we want to do it the right way. Uh, for instance, you know, I know we uh, are in the process of rebuilding the fish population in Somerset Lake, and, and that process really started with putting uh, a bunch of shiners in to, as the first fish species to really, again, rebuild that community. So making sure that we're putting the right fish in at the right time. Uh, so number one, that the food chain is correct, but also two, that we don't have inadvertent consequences of the wrong species going in and wiping out another species. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to do was just give a timeline of you know where we're at and how this all got started and and really back in March of 2022 we first brought this in front of this very committee to talk about this goal of of rewriting rewriting chapters 71 and 73 into a single chapter 71A. Uh, the entire board of commissioners approved a proposed proposed rule in April of last year. After that, there was a formal public comment period and, and well over a thousand comments did come in for the commission to consider. What we did is we took a look at those comments, figured out, you know, uh, what changes were needed or could be needed and did discuss the, I'll call it the themes of those comments at a committee meeting uh, in September of last year. Since then, we've worked with stakeholders uh, and broad stakeholders to come up with changes. Uh, again, that summary of changes was addressed both in January and a status update on the process was given a couple months ago at a committee, committee meeting in April. Next slide. As I mentioned, outreach with stakeholders throughout this process has been crucial and vital. You know, we did put a proposed rule out and, and prior to the proposed rule worked with some stakeholders uh, on language, notably the aquaculture advisory committee to, to really figure out, you know, what works and, and where can both parties find a common goal to, to again, for the aquatic resource management here in, in the Commonwealth. Um, but again, once the public comment period started and we saw who else was involved, We've really been coordinating with our, our sister agency, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, to really see where their jurisdiction ends and where ours starts. And, and again, figuring out uh, 
again, just from a, an aquaculture perspective, how both agencies can work together. During that common period and, and shortly after, we had several meetings across the Commonwealth with another important partner, Cooperative Nurseries. They raise uh, trout, they stock it in local streams, and we wanted to hear their feedback on this proposal and, and how it can be improved from a language standpoint to make it sure it works smoothly for them. We've had several meetings with various fishing clubs in the state, and, and again, from a stocking perspective of how do they operate? What works? And again, getting their feedback on you know, what, how the proposal itself could be improved so that it's a win win for everybody. And as I mentioned, throughout this entire process, dating back to you know, a few years ago, we've had continuous sharing of the drafts to solicit that feedback, that input, their expertise and institutional knowledge to make sure we're putting forth the best product that we can. That works for everybody, but still maintains the integrity of this proposal. Next slide, please. So at a bird's eye view, this is what the new chapter would be structured and looks like. What we've done is we've included a lot of provisions that were present in both chapters 71 and 73, for instance, the, the you know, triploid grass carp. Uh, that was present, it works. We wanted to carry that over, but we also wanted to include a few new provisions and organize things a little bit better so that they flow more naturally. Uh, again, for instance, the notice of stocking to the commission, which Dave Nyhart will go into detail in his presentation. I mentioned fish health and again, that watercraft inspection or uh, requirements that I mentioned at the earlier part of my presentation. So again, just a, a slide on what the new chapter would look like and how it's structured. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, our stakeholder input and public comments, they really have been vital throughout this process to, you know, to help us improve this proposal. So what I wanted to do was just go through some changes based on that input from the proposed rule that was put out last April to the drafts that we're working on now um, that were provided to uh, <clears throat> to commissioners and, and again, stakeholders throughout the process. So we didn't add a definition of ornamental pond. It wasn't present in the proposed rule, but we wanted to make sure we could clarify what that meant. And again, what is not subject to a notice of stocking requirement. For now, we are going to focus on a notice of stocking <clears throat> to get the necessary data as to where fish are being put in waters of the Commonwealth and to have a better understanding from a fisheries management perspective. Uh, again, we, we heard from folks on a couple things that we were trying to do and felt like this would be the best way to start off this process to get that necessary information and data to understand more how uh, Fishery stocking is occurring in the Commonwealth, again, to improve that management. We did eliminate language requiring water testing for transporting fish. That language or requirement was present in the proposed rule. And we did hear from you know, the aquaculture community as well as the fishing clubs community on the challenges to comply with that. So that really, you know, made us sit back and think, you know, is, you know, is this impossible to comply with and, and necessary? And we thought, hey, you know, e even for ourselves, that would be difficult. So we wanted to listen and take that into account and did eliminate that language that was very broad in the first proposed rule. We eliminated language referring to staff review, appeals, procedure, et cetera. Again, because a notice of stocking, which Dave will go into more detail about, but that will be something that will not be approved or denied by the commission. So there's no need for those particular provisions in chapter 71 right now. We updated the effective date of the notice of stocking to kick off January 1st of 2024. We inserted a subsection that uses currently language that's in chapter 73.1, which essentially says that you can't stock fish species in watersheds where they're not present. And it also does reserve the authority for the agency to acquire fish health inspections on lots of fish transported into the Commonwealth. Again, that's language that's already existing in chapter 73 one that we wanted to carry over. Next slide, please. As I alluded to, we inserted a subsection clarifying that a notice of stocking, it doesn't allow individuals to, to stock all 
waters, there's certain waters in the state that are prohibited from stocking, such as wilderness trout streams or catch and release streams. So we wanted to make sure that clarification and language was in our revisions. Uh, again, another uh, stakeholder feedback that we, we heard, it was, you know, language that mentioned not stocking fish, you know, with visible lesions and hemorrhaging, signs of disease. And, and, and really, you know, the aquaculture community is not in the business of stocking fish that aren't healthy. They're in the business of stocking fish that are, that are healthy for, for customers uh, throughout the state. So we wanted to remove that language, seeing that it was unnecessary. And again, that was a uh, direct result of our communications with that stakeholder. We did update the effective date of the fish health protocol to January 1 of 2026. That's to give our partners in the aquaculture industry time to, to comply with any requirements if applicable. We did update the definition of a VHS susceptible species uh, to include the War World Organization for Animal Health, uh, their manual. And again, Koja, our fish health unit leader could go into detail on that when he presents. And then lastly, we did remove reference to aquatic noxious weeds in the proposed rule within the prohibited species list. Again, in, in conversations, both internally and with stakeholders, we realized that it's difficult, you know, for, for the most, uh, you know, versed folks, I should say, to really understand what is a noxious weed and what's just an aquatic plant. And there's, you know, hundreds and thousands of them out there. So what we did to avoid any confusion is we removed that reference to aquatic noxious weeds because the watercraft inspection requirements in the proposed rule, that would encompass any uh, aquatic vegetation when you're leaving a, a boat ramp or launch area. And, and again, the prohibit, the uh, prohibiting of taking that to another water body. So again, didn't want to sow confusion and thought it would be better to remove that reference because the watercraft inspection section would take care of that and have the same effect. So again, those are my slides. I can hand it over to uh, Koja, but we'll defer to the chairman on his wishes. Okay, Koja. Thanks, Bob, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be going over the Fish and Boat Commission's Fish Health Inspection Protocol document, um, basically providing an overview of the document the importation fish health requirements, the um, requirements for introducing or stocking fish into the Commonwealth waters, and then the actual fish health inspection and certification requirements, so what, what the actual testing is. Um, and then lastly, going over the changes since um, the April, 22, or April meeting of, in 2022. Uh, next slide. So when it came to developing the Fish and Milk Commission's Fish Health Inspection Protocol, there were several overarching goals of the protocol. Um, you know, first and foremost, we wanted to provide protection to the Commonwealth's aquatic resources in the aquaculture industry. And when we talk about the aquaculture industry, we're talking about the commercial hatcheries, the, vet, the state hatcheries, and the cooperative nurseries. Um, and we wanted to do this by preventing the introduction of specific pathogens into Pennsylvania. So pathogens that are not here, we wanna make sure that we're not introducing them with importations of fish. And then we also want to help to control the spread and prevalence of pathogens already present in the Commonwealth. I want to uh, point out that the protocol is separate from chapter 71A. Um, and this was done so that we can update our protocol when needed um, you know, quickly. Uh, and I also want to point out that when we do this, all changes will be posted in the Pennsylvania Bulletin for public comment, and then we're going to consult with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture um, prior to proposing any changes to the document. An example of you know, when we need to update this is you know, if there was a, a new pathogen that we're concerned about or, or we want to remove a pathogen and testing requirements for that pathogen, or maybe there's a a new testing protocol has been developed that uh, is not listed in the protocol. So we want to be able to add that kind of stuff um, as needed. And then as Bob mentioned, we consulted with the industry and uh, all the other stakeholders throughout the development of the protocol. Next slide. So 
So when it um, So when it came to actually what's in the protocol, we have the fish health testing requirements for importing fish into the Commonwealth. And the, um, as mentioned before, the fish health testing requirements for introducing or stocking fish into the waters of the Commonwealth. And then also we provide the information on the acceptable testing methods and protocols. Um, so and this is geared mostly towards the lab and industry. And then it's also, as Bob mentioned, we um, have the two-year grace period after implementation, which is going to allow for the industry to comply with the fish health requirements for stocking and importation. Next slide. So when it comes to the uh, importation fish health requirements, um, as I mentioned before, this is these are designed to help um, prevent the introduction of new pathogens that can could significantly harm the Commonwealth's aquatic resource and aquaculture industry and assist with preventing the increase in prevalence of specific pathogens that are already present in the Commonwealth. Uh, as Bob mentioned, we updated the current viral hemorrhagic septicemia regulations. This was in um, direct response to a lot of the comments that we got regarding the fish health inspection protocol. Um, some of the date, um, lists that were in that uh, the old regulation were outdated, so we wanted to update that. So we updated both Chapter 71A and the Fish Health Inspection Protocol. Well, I'd like to point out that some importations will not require any fish health testing. Um, the testing itself is based on the species being imported in the shipping location or where the fish originated from, and these testing requirements were determined using you know, a, a risk-based approach, which takes into account the known geographical range of the pathogen, so where that pathogen is found, and the susceptibility of fish to that specific pathogen. Um, you know, not all fish are, are susceptible to the same pathogens. Next slide. And so this table here kind of shows um, how that approach would work, and these are just a bunch of examples. Um, you look at the first row, if you're looking at bluegills, you know, if you still want to import bluegills from North Carolina, um, you know, there would be no testing requirements for those. However, if you were importing fathead minnows from uh, Arkansas, there would be at least one pathogen that you'd want to test for there, or that we'd require the, the importer to test for. Um, if you move on to you know, the third row, um, we're looking at brown trout. And if you were to import brown trout from Maine, there's a, a virus that's known to exist in Maine, um, infectious salmon, salmon and anemia virus. Um, at this point, it's only known to be present in Maine, so we'd want those fish tested from Maine. Uh, we want those fish tested for that virus. However, if you the next row, you're still seeing the same species, brown trout. These are being imported from West Virginia. That virus is not in West Virginia, and so we're not worried about that virus or anything else coming from West Virginia. Um, the pathogen makeup of West Virginia is very similar to Pennsylvania. Um, if you look at rainbow trout, however, that were coming from West Virginia, we'd be worried about gill lice. So we'd want those fish tested for certified gill lice free. Um, that's because gill lice are our rainbow trout are susceptible to gill lice, where brown trout are not. If you take that same species, rainbow trout, and you import them from California, there's a whole bunch of different pathogens that we'd be concerned about, including gill lice. And then the last row, which shows the difference between eggs and fish. Um, if, if you think of gill lice, they attach to fish, but they're not transmitted in the egg. So that you know, we wouldn't be concerned about gill lice if you were just um, transporting eggs from California into Pennsylvania. So hopefully the table kind of gives you an idea of the, the risk-based approach that we took. Um, you know, we're not saying that you have to test for every pathogen all the time. Uh, it's, it's really situation dependent. Next slide, please. As far as importation or enforcement of the importation um, requirements, there will be no importation authorization or permit for staff to review. And the enforcement will mimic the current VHS regulations. And 
the way that that works is that the um, shipping party um, is responsible for making for being familiar with our regulations and the shipping entity must produce the proper documentation when requested by Fish and Boat Commission law enforcement. So if somebody is shipping fish into Pennsylvania, they have to make sure that they have the proper paperwork with the truck or whatever vehicle is moving the fish into Pennsylvania. If, you know, if they're stopped by a WCO, they have to be able to produce that. Next slide, please. So when it comes to the introduction, our stocking fish health requirements, um, it's important to note that this applies to all stocking, um, Fish and Boat Commission, Cooperative Nursery, uh, you know, the Federal U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or USGS is stocking, academic stockings, and commercial stockings. So anytime fish are being put into the waters of the Commonwealth. And it's also important to note that it only applies to species that are permitted to be introduced into the Commonwealth waters. Um, so, you know, an example of this would be tilapia. Um, there's several farms that grow tilapia in Pennsylvania, and there are some pathogens you know, that specifically affect tilapia, but you're not allowed to stock tilapia in the Commonwealth waters. So we didn't address any of those pathogens that affect tilapia. And we designed this to provide a protection or provide pr protection on a variety of levels from a specific large watershed. So you think of something like the Susquehanna or the Great Lakes or Lake Erie watershed, um, Delaware watershed, uh, or to the whole entire state, which is self-explanatory. And the uh, regulations themselves are dependent on the species being stocked and the stocking location. Um, so with the importation, we were concerned about where the fish originated. With the introduction and stocking, we're concerned about where the fish are going uh, in the species. And it's important to note that many stockings will, not, will have no or minimal fish health requirements. And it does not uh, require all facilities to conduct fish health inspections only if they meet the specific requirements in the protocol. Um, so if, if a facility is raising fish for the food market and they're not selling fish to be stocked, this will not apply to them. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the gill ice certification requirements. Um, this is an example of one of we're calling a statewide requirement. This only applies to fish obtained from the PA Department of Agriculture registered propagators or dealers. So the, in order to sell fish in Pennsylvania, you have to either be a, a propagator or a registered propagator or dealer. So it only applies to those um, types of fish or fish from a Fish and Boat Commission state hatchery or cooperative nursery. And this language was changed uh, as a result of public comments as well. It only applies to brook trout, rainbow trout, and tiger trout. Uh, it's not applicable to brown trout. Brown trout are not susceptible to gill lice. Basically what they say is if you're um, obtaining fish from a facility, lot, or shipment that has been, uh, you must, fish must be obtained from a facility, lot, or shipment that has been certified gill ice free following Fish and Boat Commission's gill ice certification protocol. And once again, this is for all stocking in the state when it comes to brook trout and rainbows. And this currently applies to all commission stocking. So we're following this from out of, when fish come out of our state hatcheries, everything certified gill ice free. All of our cooperative nursery stockings are certified gill ice free. And any stockings requiring a PFBC special activities permit so this is already being applied across the state in a limited scope. Uh, this just broadens that. Next slide, please. So there are some special requirements um, for the Great Lakes watershed. And so this would be an example of uh, require, uh, requirements for a specific watershed or drainage. This applies to stocking of fish into the Lake Erie and Lake Ontario watershed, it includes portions of Erie, Crawford, and Potter County. 
And what we're saying here is that fish must be obtained from a facility or be from a lot of fish that are tested negative for the following pathogens and parasites following the Fish and Boat Commission's protocol. And there's a list of the pathogens there. I'm not going to go through them. But basically what this does is it ensures that the Fish and Boat Commission is fulfilling its duties as a member of the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission and also as a member of the Great Lakes Fish Health Committee. And it's important to note that the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, both our state hatcheries and our cooperative nurseries already meet all these requirements. So we've already been doing this. We're just asking everybody else to do it as well now. Next slide, please. When it comes to the enforcement of the uh, fish health stocking requirements, the, the notice of stocking instructions, which will be with the notice of stocking that Dave's going to present on later, um, will clearly state when a fish health certificate is needed. So when these fish health requirements um, are going to take place. If required, the notice of stocking uh, applicant is responsible for obtaining and ensuring that the fish health certificates are present at the stocking and are presented to the Fish and Boat Commission when requested. So this is not on the commercial farm uh, where they get the fish from. It's on the applicant to make sure that, that that farm has the proper documentation and that they receive that from the farm. And aquaculture facilities are not required to conduct or pay for the annual fish health inspections. Um, they fall under the jurisdiction of the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, so we can't require that. Depending on the stocking location and the species being stocked, some stocking events will not have any fish health requirement. Um, example of this would be uh, you have brown trout are being stocked somewhere in the, the Susquehanna Basin. Uh, they, don't, they don't have um, any gill ice um, requirements associated with brown trout. And so they should be able to stock those fish and not have any kind of fish health requirements. Next slide, please. When it comes to the fish health inspection and report protocols, the uh, fish health inspections will be valid for one year from the date of issuance. The number of fish that need to be sampled in the accepted testing protocols are the same in many surrounding states, such as New York, Maryland, and New Jersey. This is designed to uh, help the commercial aquaculture so they don't have to do additional testing. If they're sending fish to New York, they're already going to have to do this testing, and it will be covered in Pennsylvania as well. Same thing, they're sending fish to Maryland or New Jersey. And if a facility tests positive for a specific pathogen, the protocol outlines ways for that facility to demonstrate freedom from that pathogen. Next slide, please. Also included in the protocol, um, it provides the required qualifications for the individuals conducting the inspection. And I want to point out that um, any individual meeting these requirements can perform the hatchery inspection. Uh, this includes employees of the hatchery, as long as they meet those requirements that are in the protocol. It allows for a variety of reports and certifications that are standard in the industry. We provide uh, a sample report that they can use if they'd like, um, but anything is, any report or document, as long as it has all the information that we're asking for, will be accepted. And the requirements for a facility to demonstrate freedom from a pathogen will only require a single facility or lot inspection without detecting a pathogen. Next slide, please. So as far as the updates that have occurred since uh, last April or April of 20, 2022, um, there were a lot of minor um, grammatical update uh, changes. But as far as the major ones, as I mentioned before, we updated the VHS language, both in Chapter 71 and also in the Fish Health Inspection Protocol, uh, brought that up to date. We inserted language that, um, Saying that certification through programs such as the Comprehensive Aquaculture Health Program Standards, also called CAPS, will be accepted by the Fish and Boat Commission. Um, basically, what we said is anything that the USDA would put their stamp on, we'd accept. 
we added the language stating that a fish obtained from a PA Department of Agriculture registered propagator, PA Department of Agriculture registered dealer, PFBC state hatchery or PFBC cooperative nursery must be certified utilized free following the Fish and Boat Commission's utilized certification program. Uh, protocol. Prior to this, we said that any brook trout or rainbow trout, regardless of where they came from, needed to be certified, utilized free. Um, what this changed is, is that it allowed for someone who purchases fish from a certified facility and holds them in a private pond or raceway to forego recertification of the fish prior to releasing them into a water of the Commonwealth. And we had, had heard some of the comments and concerns that um, some, some times people or clubs will purchase fish from a, a commercial dealer, hold them in a pond or raceway on their property for a day or two, and then stock, then they'll actually take them out to the stream and put them where they want them to go. Um, and the problem with the, the past language was that that would have required that those fish that were only held for a day or two in, in that little pond or raceway would have to be recertified prior to being released into the stream on the same property. And we were told that, you know, sometimes it's only a couple hundred fish and it, it, it wasn't cost effective to have those fish recertified or there wasn't time to get somebody out there to certify those fish. So we looked at that and realized that it, that was a difficult, that would be difficult and we changed the language to this here. Next slide, please. Uh, we reduced the requirements for a facility to demonstrate freedom from a pathogen to require only a single facility lot inspection uh, without detecting the industry or without detecting a pathogen. And this was um, requested by the industry. Uh, you know, the way it was written before, they could it could have taken three years to demonstrate um, uh, freedom from a pathogen. So this would would just require a single testing and, and maybe a year worth of, uh, you know, being down or not being able to make a profit off of their, their fish. Then we added language clarifying the process for updating the fish health inspection protocol. And um, this included citing um, where this language was in um, Chapter 71A as well. And then as, as Bob mentioned before, um, you know, as we did in Chapter 71A, we removed all references to a stocking authorization. Next slide. So in summary, uh, when it comes to the fish health inspection protocol, the uh, protocol provides a vital tool to aid the Fish and Boat Commission in its mission with protecting, conserving, enhancing aquatic resources, Commonwealth. Um, provides protection to the Commonwealth's aquaculture industry, um, commercial hatcheries, our state hatcheries, cooperative nurseries, and you know, it'll help protect everybody. Similar requirements to surrounding states uh, in Great Lakes Fish Health or Fish Commission member agencies, it brings us in line with these other states. And there may be a financial impact to the aquaculture industry. However, as we mentioned before, we've worked with the industry throughout the process and we've tried to uh, reduce this impact as much as we can while still providing the protection to the aquatic resource. And just a reminder, fish health testing will not be required for all stockings or imports in that the protocol is separate from the actual Chapter 71A and this was so that we can modify it as needed. And that concludes uh, my presentation on the fish health inspection protocol. I'll turn it over to Dave Nyhart. Dave, this is uh, Richard Lewis, Commissioner Lewis. Before you get started, I have a housekeeping item to, to handle. <clears throat> I earlier had a roll call of the committee members and all committee members were present as well as our chairman of the commission, B.J. Small. But uh, in order to have this <clears throat> webinar type meeting work effectively, I want to acknowledge that uh, four other commissioners, which make a component of all 10 commissioners are on the call or on the webinar. And I need to check to make sure that they're signed on correctly so that they're able to communicate when they have an opportunity to make comments or questions. So as I call your name, commissioners, please just indicate that 
um, you're present, number one, and that you're able to, to communicate with us. Uh, Charlie Charlesworth. Yes, I'm present. And I okay. You're very low volume, but I did hear you, Charlie. Thank you. Dan Pastore. Present. Thank you, Dan. John Mon. Present. Thank you, John. Bill Gibney. Okay, Bill, um, I see that you're signed on, um, but under the attendee uh, section rather than the participant section, if it's possible for you to switch into the attendee session, excuse me, the participant session somehow, that will enable you to be able to ask questions or make comments if, as you need. Uh, I thank the other four commissioners for attending this committee meeting and appreciate your attendance. Dave, uh, please proceed with your presentation. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Lewis. So um, next we'll talk about the last part of this presentation. We're gonna focus on the notice of stocking and as was mentioned multiple times throughout um, Bob and Coach's presentation is, you know, the engagement with stakeholders and, and uh, the public to really get this thing right. And one of the biggest changes that was made as a result of the public comments, as Bob mentioned, we had over a thousand public comments and a majority of those were focusing in on one particular part of 71A, that being the notice of stocking. Um, so as you guys can remember through the proposed rulemaking, we were highlighting the stocking authorization. We have kind of transitioned into really focusing on, on the notice of stocking. So the next couple of slides will we'll highlight what the notice of stocking is and get into the development of the form and ultimately what information we're going to be requesting as part of the notice of stocking. So as far as the notice of stocking goes, no species of fish will be introduced or placed or stocked into waters of the Commonwealth except for angling purposes without the submission of a notice of stocking. And it's important to know that waters of the Commonwealth does not include the property or premise of propagation facilities, which are licensed under the Pennsylvania Department of Ag's um, development law. So the movement of fish within a, a aquaculture facility does not require a notice of stocking. The notice of stocking only applies to species that are on the commission's um, watershed approved for open system. So op often you hear this is our intro and prop list. Um, next. The submission of notice of stocking does not authorize individuals or organizations to stock waters that are prohibited from stocking. And this was touched on earlier, so it does not give individuals the ability um, to stock areas that are currently prohibited. You know, and a couple of the ones that we've talked about are Class A waters, our wilderness trout streams, um, and catch and release areas, just to name a couple. So one other change was that beginning on January 1st of 2024, the notice of stocking shall be fully effective. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna look at the development of, of the form. So not only the input we received helped, you know, really um, guide the future structure of 71A, but we also took that feedback that we received from, from various folks to help with the development of the form as well. So really a couple of things that we were hearing from users is, is we needed something that was gonna be user friendly. You know, when we're looking really to get as much data and information on what's occurring in PA, we have to provide a product or a system that allows users to easily um, submit that information. So we developed a single page user friendly form. One of the other things that we've heard was, is we need to have different options for submission. You know, some folks feel that electronic submission is a preferred method while we're also having folks out there that want to be able to submit something manually, you know, through the mail or, you know, fax or email in a paper copy as well. The last thing is there's no, there's no cost to the user. So this is completely free. So when somebody sets down and submits, they notice a stocking, there's no charge associated with that at all. Another one of our key stakeholders that we had to consider was our cooperative nursery program. So, you know, we're looking at, at you know, over 150 cooperative nurseries in the state that are stocking over, you know, a, a million fish annually. So knowing that they would be falling under this uh, umbrella as well, we needed to make sure that, that what we were ruling out would have minimal impacts to them. So this notice of stocking is going to replace the, their current tentative stocking schedule that they have. We're also looking to, to really minimize the, the, the amount of redundant paperwork that co-ops would have to submit. Next slide, please. 
So as far as the actual form, there's five different sections on the form. And we'll get into, into, into highlight the detail or get into details on these uh, actual sections in a few slides. But um, the five categories are applicant information, the stocking category, stocking location, fish species, and then the origin of the fish. And I will point out that in addition to this form, we'll also have detailed instructions that will go along with the form, really allowing the user uh, that's submitting this to be able to provide accurate information. In addition to um, specific instructions for the form, you know, there's going to be a huge outreach component, not only to the notice of stocking, but to the changes in 71A. So, you know, as an agency, um, focusing on outreach efforts, you know, whether it's information on our website, you know, we know there's going to be a, a huge outreach needed for this. So we're fully ready um, to provide that information to the, to the public um, when, when, when appropriate. Next slide, please. So now looking at the sections that are provided. So again, this is a draft form that we've pulled together. Looking at the first two sections, section one being the applicant information. So just basic general information on the individual organization that is applying for the notice of stocking. And you can see here, you know, the, their individual's name, you know, where they're located, if they're affiliated with a cooperative nursery or any other type of organization. And really, you know, if this information is important, you know, if we have to reach back out to anybody, you know, this allows us the avenue to correctly and, and easily identify the individuals or groups that's doing the stocking. The second section is the stocking category. So we've broken it down into three categories, general stocking, fishing derbies or tournaments and a restoration project. And we expect that in large, most of the categories that will be occurring or stocking that will be occurring will probably be tied to a general stocking. But if it's tied with a, a fishing derby or tournament, you can see highlighted in the lower um, right corner in green that the notice of stocking, in addition to a notice of stocking, the applicant will also be required to fill out a special activities permit. So we provide a link you know, so the user can easily go and access the special activities permit form to fill out as well. Next slide, please. So getting into sections three and four, section three is the stocking location information. So really this is the opportunity for the applicant to provide us with information on where the stocking is occurring. And you can see multiple things that we're, we're looking to get here. Um, the type of water, is, is it a stream? Is it a lake? Is it a pond? You know, where is the stocking occurring? Is it occurring on public or private land? What's the name of the water body? And really, you know, we as an agency have identified a lot of the waters that we currently manage and have names associated with them, but there's a lot of local names that people give these waters. So in addition to asking this information, you can see on the top right-hand corner, there's a link to Google Maps. So we're allowing people to use these outside mapping um, software to better pinpoint and identify where the stocking is occurring, whether it's providing a name, you know, or you can see here in the next columns or next rows down below, providing some lat lawn information. Really, the more detailed information that we can get as an agency uh, really allows us to know not only, um, it allows us to know where the stocking is occurring. A couple other things to point out, and a lot of this too, again, was based off of a stakeholder feedback, is there were concerns on how long would these um, applications be, be valid for them valid for, and, and they're valid for our current year, but to kind of get a better understanding of when the stocking is occurring, you know, we asked them to put a date range here. So we're not tying this to one specific date. So the one thing we heard is, well, what if we say we want to stock fish on July 1st and, you know, the stocking truck breaks down or there's a rain event that prohibits us from stocking, do we have to submit another one of these? And the answer is no. So we're asking you to submit a date range associated with the stocking. The last thing is, is in section three is how many stocking events are, are going on. Um, if it's more than one, indicate how many. And this is, again, something that we heard from, from the various stakeholders is, do I have to submit one of these every time I do a stocking? And the answer is, is no. They would be specific to an individual water. If you're stocking that water 10 times, you only need to submit this form once and you just indicate you know, how many estimated, how many stockings are going to occur on this one form. The next section, section four is the fish species information. So we included um, 
areas for individuals to indicate what type of spe what type of fish species will be being stocked. You know, rainbow trout, um, you know, tiger muskie, whatever the case may be. And then we also are asking what the total number will be stocked. And again, based off of input we had from industry on this one, you know, not everything that they do is, is based off of a number being stocked. Oftentimes, it can be based on a weight. So we've allowed the user to indicate whether or not the total being provided is in number is is based off the total number or the pounds associated with that stocking. Next slide, please. In the last part of the form, the last two sections would be section five, which is looking at the origin of the fish. Again, pretty basic information. It's the same information that we request on our SAPs. And the last part would be the receipt that's associated with it. So if you're submitting this thing manually, you can detach uh, and retain a copy of the submission receipt that has all the information tied back to the specific form that you submitted and the chance that you're stopped by or stopped by uh, a waterways conservation officer you have proof that a notice of stocking um, was submitted. Next slide, please. So the last slide I have is, is just an overview, a summary of, of the notice of stocking. And, and really, what does this get us? It, it really provides our agency with the opportunity to not only assess the numbers and types of stockings in the Commonwealth. And as, as Bob mentioned before, there's, other, there's th roughly 30 other states in the U.S. that have some sort of requirement to liberate fish into the waters. And in fact, Pennsylvania is the only state in the Northeast that does not have any type of system in place. It enhances aquatic invasive species prevention. AIS is really at the forefront of a lot, preventing AIS is really at the forefront of a lot of what we're doing, not only in Pennsylvania, but other states as well. It allow us to gather additional data to streamline the process in the future and really, you know, inform a lot of the fisheries management um, decisions and practices that are going on now. And again, as I mentioned, the cooperative nurseries are, are a huge stakeholder in this, you know, so really, this really improves upon the current co-op stocking schedule. Uh, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, that's the last slide, so um, any questions and comments? Okay, um, thank you very much for that. Uh, both, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much to Bob and to Koja and Dave for it's very informative and a presentation requiring the scope of our proposed rule, its development process and need, and the implementation timeline. Currently, our staff intend to bring this to the full board for consideration as a final rulemaking at our July 2023 commission meeting. I personally believe there is a demonstrated need to ensure that the commission receives notifications of all proposed stocking of fish in the waters of our Commonwealth. We need this to properly manage and protect the Commonwealth's aquatic resources while addressing the increased risks associated with aquatic invasive species and pathogens as was outlined. We've undertaken this important effort to improve the management oversight and regulation of fish and aquatic life transportation and stocking in Pennsylvania through the development of this notice of stocking and fish health requirements that have been detailed in the staff presentation. I think it's, uh, I personally feel it's important to reiterate that currently 30 states have similar stocking requirements, including all of the Northeastern states, except our state of Pennsylvania. I'll now call for commissioner comments or questions on chapter 71A update and remind the commissioners that the full team of staff that have been working on this initiative are on the line and available to answer your questions. Um, <clears throat> who has a question or comment? Yeah, Richard, this is this is BJ. If I could just lead off here with a couple of observations. This has been, certainly has been a process and we've all learned quite a bit uh, throughout this. But we, one thing that we did know essentially from the beginning is there seems to be, seemed to be consensus across the board that we need protection, that we need to, uh, to, to manage and to know what's coming into the Commonwealth. And so we're kind of buoyed by that, you know, common, you know, kind of a common goal here. And as we look at this, what we have at this point and the protocol, uh, we need to keep in mind that there is uh, overview and review 
throughout, especially with the protocol um, as, it, as it relates to the Department of Ag and there's public comment. So, you know, the protocol is something that is, will continue to be, as we have here, uh, very transparent. And, uh, you know, we are, hopefully will continue to, to listen to public comment and, and professionals and, and those that we serve. I commend the staff for uh, their patience to get us to this point. And um, um, I look forward to, to, to being able to protect the resource uh, that we're gonna be able to, uh, to get from this rewrite of 71A. Thanks, Richard. And thank you, BJ. Any other commissioners have a comment or a question on the staff presentations on this uh, proposed uh, 71A regulation. I do, Richard. It's Commissioner Gibney. Yes, Bill, go ahead. So, thank you. So, to begin, I want to uh, really thank Bob, Dave, Koja, um, Chris, everybody who I know I missed somebody there, but I, I'm how hard everybody worked up with this and with the public as uh, and the other stakeholders involved. This is not, this was a long process. So uh, first, and, first and foremost was the cooperation or responsiveness to public concerns and input. And uh, that was a big lesson uh, for everybody in this regarding, you know, we really need to listen to uh, what our, our stakeholders, the fishermen have to say. So, having said that, uh, Dave, I have a couple of questions regarding the application itself. Um, first of all, it asks for the pounds or number of fish, and well, some of the feedback I've heard is like, we like to do this application in January. We don't know because, in, such as in a case like this year, they may have ordered 1,000 pounds of fish and then there's no water, so they're holding now or canceling uh, stocking for the rest of the year. So is, is there a way or do they have to update this estimation or what really should they just put in an estimation if you're, if we're gonna apply in January uh, and not stock until May, <clears throat> what is happening with this number? Is it, is it updated? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Gibney. So really there's there's no process or no ask in place for applicants to provide updated information. When we get this, we're assuming if it's on there, it, it's gonna happen. So if they're requesting or indicating that they're stocking, you know, 500 rainbow trout in July, and for some reason they don't, we, we do not need to be notified. What happens though if they decide to stock more than that? So for a really good year or whatever, or in the case of a place that has a lot of rental visitors and they have no way of anticipating that, and they're asked to place more fish out than is on the estimation. Um, does that need to be updated or so they just estimate high? And we, and we, I think we may have had this conversation, not me and you, but you know, this is something that was asked at some of our meetings too, and, and really, do your best to estimate it, but it's the same thing. If, if you indicate that you're gonna stock 500 fish in July and something happens where you wanna stock 600 or 700, there's not a need to submit another updated notice of stocking. You know, a lot of this is for us to gather information and really the outreach and education part too, I, I would assume that, you know, if, if somebody has stopped and they're asked, you know, where's your notice of stocking? And they say, I'm stocking 500 fish and they have 600 um, fish on, you know, on site, you know, it's not going to be any type of violation. So really, it's just an opportunity for us to gather data, knowing that, you know, there may be some gaps based off of changes in, you know, species availability or, you know, just production numbers at some of the facilities where they're getting these fish. Okay, thank you. Now, um, is, is one of the things that is perhaps have been under, um, expected or we have we need to emphasize or i like to emphasize that not only does this protect the resources it protects the uh, people who are stocking from getting unhealthy fish from out of state or whatever so in your best estimation and maybe this is a better question for koja 
when a new pathogen shows up, how, what will be the response time to, you know, react to that? Like, do, do we need to change the regulation? How will that, that new pathogen be dealt with? Yeah. Um, so, you know, once it's, you know, we know that the pathogen is confirmed in an area and, and you know, that, that it would be a risk. Um, and typically there's, there's multiple, you know, different organizations out there that, that can help with this. But, uh, you know, once something's deemed a risk to the Commonwealth waters, we would, you know, start the process of, of doing this. Now, you know, start with the, um, you know, formatting the language and then putting it in the, uh, you know, consulting with staff and then putting it, you know, the way it's written now, it has to go into the, the bulletin for public comment. We consult with the Department of Ag prior to that, um, but it can be done, you know, to that to that spot um, fairly quickly. Um, I'm not exactly familiar with, with how long things take once they get put in the bulletin. Uh, Bob, somebody else might be able to answer that, but you know, the process will be started as soon as possible. I guess is the best way to answer that. Okay, so anyway, I, I wanted to, to point out that this is not something we're going to be able to, or we would ever surprise people with and say, tomorrow you can't release these fish because we have identified a new pathogen. It it's, would be a process that would have public notification and cooperation with the aquaculture industry. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's definitely fair to say. Okay, thank you. I don't really have anything else. Uh, the other questions I, I was going to ask uh, were cleared up during the presentation. So, but again, thank you to everyone who worked on this for as long and as hard as you did. Uh, it was a challenge to say the least. Thank you. And thank you, Bill. Uh, this is Commissioner Lewis again. Um, also, a request, uh, if there are more comments or, or, or questions to the staff, which I expect will be on this agenda item and other, uh, will the staff please uh, start by identifying yourself? Say, um, this is Kojo or, or this is Dave, because uh, otherwise the uh, attendees, I can see who's talking here on my screen, but attendees would not be know who the, which staff is responding. So I'll uh, again ask, uh, are there other questions or comments from commissioners on this proposed regulation. Richard, this is uh, Commissioner Hussar. Go ahead, Eric. Good morning. I guess on a broader note, yeah, this has been a, a, a journey, um, um, a lot of feedback. Um, I like to see where we're at right now. It looks, looks good in my eyes. And I, you know, just to remind I guess on a broader note, to remind everybody, not only the stakeholders, but uh, um, I mean, this, this initiative aligns with Article 1, Section 27 of the PA Constitution, and that this applies to, um, this will benefit all people of the Commonwealth. And Richard, as you said, it aligns with our mission statement. So uh, um, I, 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 I feel we're at a good spot now. I like what I see. Um, we vetted this, um, and uh, um, I like to see, you know, we're moving forward in the right direction here. And uh, um, I just wanted to, you know, again, this is for all people. It's for um, what we do for the as the agency. And uh, um, I like the format we used, uh, the forms, the one page looks good to me. I think that falls in line with what I've seen in other states. And uh, I guess this will be work in progress going forward, but it's a, it's a great start. And I'm looking forward to uh, July's meeting on this. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Uh, any other commissioner comments or questions? Okay, if not, um... I will uh, like to mention that uh, there are 22 uh, attendees uh, that are attending this committee meeting. Um, they're not participants. We have additional number that are participants. Uh, 
but we have 22 attendees, which is great. It's a very good attendance, uh, probably higher than we would have. I'm sure it's higher than we would have if we had this meeting in person in Harrisburg or other places. As I looked over the attendee list, a couple of names popped up and uh, I noticed that Brian Whipke is on the on the attendee list. Brian, we uh, appreciate your being here. And also we appreciate your fine coverage of uh, fish and, and boat commission activities and projects. Um, uh, Brian's a journalist. Uh, I see Dave Rothrock is here. Dave, I appreciate your attendance. Uh, I know you're probably here or listening in for Trout Unlimited. Uh, and uh, and last but not least, I see that Dave Swope, who is a former chairman of the um, Adams County Trout Unlimited chapter, is also listening in. And um, not that I don't also appreciate all the other uh, 19 folks that are also participating. I just don't know all of you or can't identify you because it's just a phone number. But I want to thank you for attending this meeting. <clears throat> We're now at 11.13 a.m. We still have uh, four more agenda items to cover, uh, but um, I, I'm sure that many of you, like me, need a short break. So I'm going to call a break now. It's 11.14 uh, AM, I'm going to restart this meeting again at uh, 1124 AM, and uh, I will see you then. Chair of the Commission's Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee meeting, and I'm going to reconvene this, this meeting. I, uh, I want to again mention that I appreciate the fact that we have very good attendance about 40 participants, 20 of which are actual participants in uh, this webinar and another 20 who are attending uh, virtually to listen in on what we're discussing. Uh, so with that, <clears throat> the next on our agenda is an update on the proposed alternative management strategy for Class A wild, brout, wild brown trout stream section stocked with trout by the commission that was first introduced at our April 2023 uh, meeting of this committee. <clears throat> Specifically, this proposal is to implement a special regulation on 11 stream sections designated Class A all tackle and also stocked with trout by the commission. We feel this proposal will better manage wild brown trout with catch and release regulations and maintain Commonwealth inland waters regulations for all the other trout species in these sections while we're continuing to stock these sections with rainbow trout. I'll now turn the meeting over to Fisheries Management Division Chief Dave Nyhart for his update. Will you please um, go ahead, Dave? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Commissioner Lewis. So as Commissioner Lewis mentioned, mentioned next on the, on the agenda is we're gonna discuss the uh, proposed alternative management strategy for class A wild brown, wild brown trout stream sections that are also stocked by the PFBC. And a lot of things that we do specific to trout um, and presented at commissions or committee meetings, you can see have a tie back to our agency strategic plan for the management of trout fisheries in Pennsylvania. And, and this issue is no different specifically this is issue three in the trout plan. Um, so there are 13 stream sections that do support a class A wild brown trout that we also continue to stock as part of our stock trout waters program. So really the, the issue that we're trying to address is get some updated biological and social data to see if there's a way that we can improve the current management on these stream sections. Next slide, please. So just for your reference, this shows where the 13 stream sections are located. You can see a majority of the stream sections are located in, in central Pennsylvania and northeastern Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. So quickly, what, what is the current management strategy applied to these stream sections? Again, these, these 13 stream sections are all designated as Class A wild trout stream sections, and they're all remain in the stock trout waters program stocked with rainbow trout. So 12 of the 13 stream sections are managed under Commonwealth inland regulations. The one stream section that is not is Yellow Creek Bedford County section five. It is managed under catch and release fly fishing only regulations. So any change in regulations that, that happens will only be happening on 12 of the 13 stream sections and will exclude section five of Yellow Creek. 
So of the 12 stream sections that are fall under Commonwealth inland regulations, it's a five trout per day minimum size of seven inches from opening day of trout season, which is the first Saturday in April at 8 a.m. through uh, midnight Labor Day. The remainder of the year, they're managed as catch and release with no harvest from the day after Labor Day to the third Sunday in February. So it, it's worth noting that um, this differs from how we manage our stock trout waters. Typically, stock trout waters will fall into the extended season. There is no extended season applied to these 12 stream sections, even though they are managed as part of the stock trout waters program. They are closed from fishing from 12.01 uh, a.m. on the third Monday in February to opening day. Next slide, please. So really what are the timeline of the events? Um, so as part of issue three identified in the plan, we recognize the need to get uh, updated biological and social data. Uh, so biological and social data evaluations were conducted on 12 of the 13 stream sections in 2021. Back at the January 2022 Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee meeting, a broad overview of our uh, preliminary results were presented during that meeting. Next slide, please. Uh, more recently, um, the alternative management strategy was presented at just a few months ago at our April 2023 Fisheries Hatcheries Committee meeting. And we really got into the details of what we learned both from the data that was collected um, on the resource and the users of the resource. Uh, during that meeting, uh, it was presented to the committee meeting and following the presentation, we were asked and which the presentation was viewed favorably by, by the committee members. We were asked to kind of proceed in the next step and, and really get feedback um, from landowners. You know, with any regulation change that's being proposed on, on uh, uh, property that's not Commonwealth property, you know, whether it's, you know, fishing boat property, be or the case may be. We also, we always solicit feedback from landowners, and this case is no different. So following um, contacting landowners in general, there was support for a change in the alternative management strategy, and staff have no concerns with a loss of angler access if this management strategy is applied to any of these 12 stream sections. We feel pretty confident uh, that anglers will still be able to, you know, obviously fish these, these valuable resources. So the next step would be to bring this proposal to the board uh, for consideration as a proposed rulemaking at the July 2023 commission meeting. Next slide, please. So just to provide a little refresher, uh, and Commissioner Lewis did mention this in his, his introduction, uh, what the miscellaneous special regulation would be. Um, it, there's no change in terminal tackle, so there's no restrictions on what can be used. All tackle types are permitted. Really, the, the only change would be uh, at the species at which can be harvested within these sections. So brown trout will be managed as catch and release with no, har with no harvest. All other species um, of trout present in these stream sections would fall under Commonwealth inland regulations, which would be uh, seven inches minimum size limit with a daily crew limit of five from the opening day through Labor Day. And again, no change uh, after Labor Day, these waters would still be managed as catch and release fisheries. All species except for trout will continue to be managed under Commonwealth inland regulation. Next slide, please. So what why or you know what what information did we did we gain or do we have that really leads us to think that this is the right regulation? Um, so really, we feel that we will see an uh, increased protection to the wild brown trout populations. So not only can they grow in abundance, but really, you know, improve size structure, meaning we're going to see some larger fish in these systems than we see now. It optimizes angling opportunities for those folks that want to catch larger brown trout. And really, you know, it's a win for, for you know, anybody fishing these, whether they're there to fish for wild fish or whether they're there to fish for stock trout. They're going to continue to be stocked with the rainbow trout, which really, you know, we've seen through these surveys, it's, it's the anglers that are going there fishing in May and April are catching a lot of stock rainbow trout. They're catching a lot of wild fish. So we're leaving that stock trout component uh, as part of the fishery. We want to be inclusive as possible with all angling groups that, you know, want to use various types of gear. So again, there would be no change 
and any type of the gear uh, being permitted to be used in these sections. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll take any questions or comments that, that commissioners may have. Okay, um, thanks, Dave. Um, <clears throat> before we get into the questions and comments, um, I want to mention that uh, this is a very detailed and ambitious agenda. I mentioned that early on, and it's very likely that we're gonna go past the time that we had allotted uh, two hours at 12 noon um, uh, I do not have a problem with that, and but I'll just notice everybody, both staff, participants, and attendees, that uh, I'm not going to rush through this agenda. These uh, the items are all very important, and if we happen to run a little past 12 noon, that's the way it's going to be. It's not going to present a problem for me, and I hope it won't for you either. With that, I thank you again, Dave, for that detailed presentation. I'll now call on questions and comments from the commissioners on the proposal uh, that the staff, uh, this proposal that the staff uh, tend to bring up uh, before our uh, commission meeting for a full board vote in, in July. So uh, any commissioners would like to comment or ask a question, please do so now. Dave, this is uh, Eric Hussar, good morning. Um, under the miscellaneous designation, is there a, is there a t time on that when that would be revisited or would that be permanent? Yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioner Sarr. Great question. So, you know, I'll provide an example that's, you know, really, you know, is something that easily to reference because it seems like we've been talking about Penn's Creek for quite some time. So when we implemented the miscellaneous special regulations, the slot limit on Penn's Creek. That section was originally put into miscellaneous. It wasn't put into a formal program until it was fully evaluated. And as you recall, you know, we were looking at, at, at the time, I think it ended up being seven years for the evaluation. So I think with any of these types of miscellaneous special regulations, we really need to evaluate them thoroughly before adopting them into any type of formal program. And these would be no different. So I would guess, you know, that we will be able to come back in five to seven years and indicate whether this miscellaneous special regulation worked. And if it did work, you know, what are, what's the commission, what staff's thoughts on formally adopting a special regulation program to then designate these stream sections into? Yes, yeah, and, Dave, and this that, is Chris. Yeah, Dave, that's, uh, I was leading into the, the, the same section three there on Penn's Creek. So thanks for the clarification there. And that makes sense, thanks. You're welcome, sir. Sure. Any other Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, th this is Chris Kuhn. I just I just wanted to add to that just a little bit to, to Commissioner Hassar's question, and in terms of it's going to be different of how we approached it with Penns Creek in that the original miscellaneous special regulation there had a sunset provision. This would not have a sunset provision to allow us ad adequate time to evaluate. Thanks for that nuance, Chris. Chris, that's that's fine. Um, any other commissioners, would you like to have a, a comment or do you have a question <clears throat> on what's been presented under this agenda item? Richard, this is Eric again. Um, yeah, we had a lot of detailed information given to us on this in prior meetings and um, um, I think it's, uh, um, Again, getting back to what we do and why we're here, um, protecting the resource, I think um, this is a step in the right direction with these wild brown trout and uh, especially on these 13 or 12 uh, areas, which are some of the best of our best of wild brown trout in PA. And uh, I, I, I think uh, it's gonna take some time takes time to uh, uh, manage these trout fisheries. Um, it takes years to determine uh, benefits of what we do. And uh, I think this is a great measure going forward. Thanks. Uh, I agree, this is Commissioner Lewis. I agree with you, Eric. And uh, I too feel the same way. Um, if this 
protocol proves to be advantageous for wild brown trout, the protocol being stocking only rainbows and, and not harvesting the wild browns in a certain stream section. It certainly, uh, if it proves to work the way we hope it does, it could become a protocol for other streams on a stream by stream basis. And they, they might not even have to be class A streams. They might be some lower classification if, if it would benefit the fishery. So I'm um, pleased to see we're giving this a good, good try in a comprehensive and a scientific way. Any other questions or comments from our commissioners? If not, uh, we'll move forward with the next agenda item a coastal fisheries related topic that affects Pennsylvania waters on the Delaware River and estuary. An overview of the emergency action taken on Atlantic striped bass by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission at its May 2023 meeting. Chris Kuhn, Director of Fisheries, will you please give us this update? Thanks, Commissioner Lewis. This is Chris Kuhn, Director of the Bureau of Fisheries. So I'm going to I'm going to hold that discussion here for now. Uh, it's it's next on our agenda. Um, next up is Dave Nyhart for the current minimum size and krill limit discussion. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Chris. Somehow I moved ahead one one item too fast. Okay, let me introduce that then. I apologize. Uh, I pulled the wrong agenda item up in front of me. Next on our agenda is an overview of staff plans for a comprehensive science-based evaluation of the current minimum size and daily limit take for trout under the Commonwealth Inland Waters Regulations. Last month, uh, my friend Commissioner Pastore contacted me with a request that the commission review the seven inch take size limit for trout as a means of further protecting wild trout, especially brook trout. When I discussed this with Fisheries Bureau Director Chris Kuhn, he noted this concept was already on the fisheries staff's radar screen. Dave Nyhart will describe the complexities of this issue, what has been done in the past, what is planned to fully inform a trout minimum size and daily limit change consideration. Dave, the mic is yours. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Lewis. Um, so next, we're going to look at the efficacy of the current minimum size and daily limit for trout under, com under Commonwealth Inland regulations. So I really wanted to get into, you know, what, what regulations that are applied to waters that are managed under Commonwealth Inland Waters regulations. So specific to trout, uh, we have the regular season, which is defined from the opening day of trout season through Labor Day. During that time period, um, there's a seven inch minimum size length and there's a five trout per day krill limit. We also, as it applies to stock trout waters, we have an extended season, which runs from the day after Labor Day through the third Sunday in February. And during that time period, it's a seven inch minimum size limit, but the daily take is reduced from five to three trout per day. It's important to know that the extended season only applies to waters that are managed as stock trout waters. All other waters outside of these stock trout waters from the day after Labor Day, uh, really through the opening day of the following year are managed under catch and immediate release only. So basically, you know, seven months out of the year, waters that are not stocked by the agency for trout are managed under catch and release regulation. Next slide, please. So to give you a brief history of how the creel limits and size limits have changed over time, in Pennsylvania, it was really hard to track down when officially size limits um, were part of the regulations for a trout. But until 1983, the size limit was six inches. As part of Operation Future that happened in 1983 and as a way to provide additional uh, protection to brook trout, adult brook trout, the increased, the minimum size limit was increased from six inches to seven inches. Again, this was primarily done uh, for the protection of brook trout. On the right-hand side, the table looks at the krill limits, the daily krill limits, really over the last almost nearly 100 years. In 1925, there was a bag limit of 25 trout per day. And you can see over time that has decreased to most currently what we had the last change in 2000 and remains the same today. We are currently at a five fish per day daily krill limit. 
Next slide, please. So really, what does staff need to do? Um, what, what needs to be evaluated to determine if a change in minimum size is warranted? Again, what is the goal? And I know Commissioner Lewis has mentioned in his introduction and in his, in his talks uh, with Commissioner Pastore, you know, is there a way to benefit brook trout? Is there a way to benefit brown trout? So really understand to see if a change is, is, is warranted, you know, what are we trying to achieve? What is the goal? We have a lot of biological and social data. Um, we have a lot of historic data and we have a lot of data that's yet to be collected. So a thorough review of both the biological and social data is needed. Um, our agency has been collecting data on individual streams for you know decades. So going back and kind of doing some data mining to see what has been collected and you know what is that telling us as far as you know distribution size of, of different wild trout or stock trout out there really needs to happen. One thing I'll mention um, is back earlier this year in March, April, and part of May, our agency did a Pennsylvania statewide survey for trout anglers. You know, it was a, a survey that we contracted out to re responsive management. And one of the questions that was asked in there, or some of the questions that was asked in there, is to kind of get a better understanding, what are the preferences from anglers, not only stock trout anglers, but, but wild trout anglers or folks that have indicated that they fish for both, you know, what are their what are their thoughts on if a change in minimum size was needed? What are, what are their thoughts on a change in curl and disease? So we have that information. We just received the rough draft report from responsive management. Staff are still going through that report. So it's it's premature at this point to say what we've learned in regard to these specific questions as part of that most recent report. Additionally, staff are planning a more comprehensive or a, a, a 2024 angler use harvest opinion survey. Um, this is what we refer to as our boots on the ground survey, very similar to what was done in 2004 and 2005 on our stock trout and, and wild trout waters, you know, actually visiting specific streams, getting a better understanding of what angler use and harvest and opinions are on the various resource categories we have for stream sections, looking at the distribution, uh, you know, regionally where these things are occurring, looking at some of our wild trout waters as well, really get a better understanding um, to, uh, of what anglers think and what is actually occurring from a, a harvest and use standpoint across the state. Next slide, please. So what else, what else do we need to consider besides the biological and social uh, data? What, what impacts could this have on our hatchery operations? So how would this impact our stock trout waters program? You know, the size of the fish, you know, coming from our, our, our eight trout hatcheries that we have in, in Pennsylvania. Also, what impacts of our cooperative nursery program? As mentioned before, we have over 150 co-ops that are stocking nearly a million trout every year. What, what would a change in minimum size or um, what kind of impacts would be felt on our co-op program? And last thing we need to look at is private stockings. What private stockings are going out there? What impacts potentially could occur to these private stockings if there was a change in the minimum size limit? And the last thing that we need to look at is a review of the fish and boat code. As you guys remember a few years ago when we updated, um, went back to a single opening day, there's a lot of stuff within code that's all tied back uh, with each other. So a thorough review of, of any potential impacts or changes to the rest of the code would need to be done. And, you know, just one example on a, a uh, regulation thing is our slot limit program. You know, currently right now our slot limit is from 7 to 12 inches as a harvestable size. You know, changing that, you know, to something different, 7, you know, how is that going to impact the fishery in those waters? So there's a lot of things that need to happen uh, as part of the fish and boat code review. Next slide, please. So really looking at a, a, a timeline um, for a change in the minimum size length, you know, if it's warranted. So now through 2024, really a, a multifaceted in-depth evaluation needs to occur on all things that we just discussed before, you know, the biological data, the social data that we have, you know, review of the code and really looking at any impacts to both private and, and in-house um, production needs to be thoroughly um, evaluated. So. We think by late 2024 or sometime early in 2025 that the findings from these evaluations will be presented at a, at a future fisheries and hatcheries committee meeting. Next slide, please. 
And with that, I'll take any questions or comments that the commissioners may have. Thank you, Dave, uh, for that detailed presentation on that concept. I'll now call for questions and comments from commissioners on a proposal. Um, and uh, we will uh, accept them now. Do any commissioners have comments or questions on this proposal? Uh, this is Dan Pastore. I'd just like to thank you for taking a look at this. I think this originated out of an earlier presentation from the hatcheries division where we were getting a report on the size of the trout that we were stocking that were all significant, significantly larger than seven inches. And my understanding is most hatcheries, or I'm sorry, most co-ops stock larger fish around over nine inches. And so the question really is, if we're if we and the co-ops are stocking fish significantly larger than seven inches, but we're allowing you to take a fish that's just over seven inches, we're effectively authorizing the harvesting of wild trout because there's no other possibility. They're either stocked or wild. And if all the stock trout are say nine inches or larger and the minimum size is seven, then that the fish within that slot from seven to whatever size we're stocking have to be wild trout that we're letting people take. So I appreciate you taking a look at that. I think it really is a, it's a policy decision whether we want to allow the harvesting of wild trout in that size limit. So thank you very much for taking a look at it. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan, for, for bringing it up. Um, I think that uh, shows again that you have a keen mind and you watch for details on the commission, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, Dave, you were about to say something. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Lewis. I was just thanking Commissioner Pastore for his comment. Okay, great. All right, um, Richard, I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Who's this? this is Commissioner Charlesworth. Um, go ahead, Charlie. Thank you. I, I was recollecting that last year we were talking about eliminating stocking brook trout. And I was just wondering if, if we did something like that, would it be just as easy to make all brook trout catch and release? Chris, what do you think? Or Dave. Yes, thanks. Thanks for the question, Commissioner Charlesworth. So, uh, we've 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 looked into um, catch and release regulations for brook trout and other wild trout waters in the past. We've discussed this, I think, a couple of times on 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 various fisheries hatcheries committee meetings. One of the things that you know we 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 come back to, and we'll get at this as as Dave mentioned in his presentation with the on the ground survey of our wild and stock trout waters to get a better estimate of harvest. You know, certainly it's gonna vary by stream section uh, or st stream itself, but typically what we find is that, that on most streams, harvest is not the limiting factor for the population. So we've taken the approach as not to uh, limit harvest where we don't feel that it's going to have a population level impact. Uh, Part of this evaluation that Dave had described will help us to answer that a little better. And I, I hope that helps with, with your question. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Okay, this is You're welcome. Uh, Commissioner Lewis again. Uh, Charlie, um, I, I too have looked into that uh, kind of concept that you have of catch and release on brook trout and not just here in Pennsylvania, because I, just intuitively felt that catch and release might, you know, increase the, the populations. And, you know, every research study that I looked at or tried to find in other areas and surrounding states, just most recently in Virginia, I made some inquiries, uh, verify what, what Chris just said, that they're just uh, uh, implementing catch and release in brook trout streams has not had a long-term effect. Uh, on, on the population of brook trout in the streams, which just seems 
weird to me, but I guess uh, I, I believe the science. Any other questions or comments yeah. on this? Richard, I'll, I, I appreciate your comments there. I'm just not sure I, um, um, you know, agree with all of that from the standpoint is we don't know. And I guess Aaron, Aaron on the caution to, uh, um, um, brook trout, um, and protecting them. What's the downside to that? But we don't have to go into that now. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, and, and, you know, and Dan's point is well taken with if we're stocking bigger fish, um, you know, I, I, I understand, um, the motivation to, uh, with his question on that, you know, they, one of the things that always comes back to me though, I, I just think anglers in general, and I could speak for myself, um, um, can't always discriminate size unless you're taping out a fish. So, uh, um, you know, though we, our intentions are good that we may change it and it may lead to saving wild fish from being harvested. Um, I just, it, 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 always, it always circles back to me that, um, you know, it's just tough to, uh, um, you know, for that to apply when you're, you know, measuring out trout. And I just think anglers in general, um, we may be close, but uh, the reality of it is uh, maybe we're off an inch or two, but, uh, um, and that's just in regards to this minimum size topic. But I think it's a good question going forward. And uh, if, if the staff would still look into the, as part of this equation about the catch and release of the brook trout to protect the brook trout, um, um, whether that would be a limiting factor in harvesting them, that's another question I have too. But uh, if you could look into that with this other uh, data and proposal and um, proposed um, topic here, um, I think that would be good going forward. So thanks. You're Richard, welcome. this is Commissioner Charlesworth again. Um, my, my comments were based on size limitations and not the, basically the harvest um, by making them catch and release. Size is not a concern at that point as to regulations. Okay, I understand your point. <laughs> um, I think that uh, every one of us are concerned about our our state fish, the brook trout, and uh, I would encourage all of us to be tuned in to any research that we can unearth um, that would help us preserve and protect this fish. Uh, most of what I'm reading says that climate change is the biggest threat to brook trout in terms of uh, warming of our streams, particularly in the higher uh, forested areas. But um, it's going to take a lot more facts and finding, and I also encourage the staff to be alert for research that would help us understand how to protect this vital resource. Uh, any other questions or comments on this proposal before we move on to the next agenda item? Okay, hearing none, um, uh, the next item up, uh, I think I have it correct this time. I'm not going to go through the whole introduction, but it will be um, Chris Kuhn reporting to us on some emergency action taken on Atlantic uh, striped bass uh, by the uh, state Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. So, Chris, would you go ahead, please? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Lewis. And uh, my name is Chris Kuhn. I'm the director of the Bureau of Fisheries. And as, as, as Commissioner Lewis stated, I'm going to be taking you through the next two well, this one and in, in, in the, in the final agenda item here for us today on our committee meeting. Um, this one, it, it pertains to the Atlantic striped bass fishery, specifically the fishery in the, the Delaware River estuary and West Branch Delaware River. So this is, this is a slide that you've seen before because we've taken similar actions uh, based on ASMFC, uh, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission actions uh, in previous years. So the in 2020, uh, under Addendum 6 to Amendment 6, which was passed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, Atlantic Striped Bass Board, 
uh, the, 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 the minimum size had been changed uh, to reflect what it currently is now, which is 28 to 35 inches in the Delaware River, West Branch, Delaware River, and estuary. And that is for two different geographic areas. Uh, basically, the, the, the estuary area from the Calhoun Street Bridge is managed a little differently and also offers a spring fishery uh, for a smaller size limit between 20 to 24 inches. But I'll focus here more on, on, on this action. And again, this is a species overview just describing the characteristics of the species. Striped bass are an anadromous species, and they annually return to uh, freshwater, river habitats, estuarine habitats in the spring, primarily for spawning. And we do have a very popular fishery in the PA waters of the Delaware River and estuary. And so at its May 2023 20, quarterly meeting, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission Atlantic Strike Bass Board approved an emergency action essentially to implement a 31 inch maximum size limit for recreational striped bass fisheries. And that's coast wide. So it does not just affect Pennsylvania, it affects all states at, that are member jurisdictions of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And the action was to be effective immediately uh, from May 2nd for at least 100. 180 days, which would take us to October 28th. And the reason for this action is there's there's a lot of data that's collected uh, by ASMFC and analyzed, and it was determined that there was extremely high recreational harvest estimates applied to the stock assessment uh, from 2022. It was nearly double, the harvest was nearly double that of, of 2021. And so as part of the Addendum 6 to Amendment 6 that I previously mentioned, uh, there's a stock rebuilding projections that are calculated on an annual basis to get to a target biomass by 2029. And once the, the new harvest estimates were applied to the Atlantic coastal stock, the, the, the probability of achieving spawning stock biomass target by 2029 fell from 97% using old estimates to 15%, so very low probability of rebuilding. And so just, just functionally, a management board with ASMSC may, may take emergency action to address different circumstances. In this case, when the conservation of a coastal fishery resource or attainment of fisheries management objectives is is at substantial risk for unanticipated changes like what we saw with the recreation increase in recreational harvest in 2022. And as I previously mentioned, part of the, the emergency action is, is to implement a 31 inch maximum size limit for 2023. And one of the reasons for that size determination is to protect a very strong 2015 year class that's coming into the current harvestable slot limit. So by lowering the upper limit from 35 to 31 inches, this would protect a, a large number of that two, 2015 year class that would hopefully then contribute to future spawning activities and, 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 and better year classes in the future. Now, the ASMSC may extend this emergency action for an additional uh, two periods of up to one year at future meetings. So I, 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 I don't know if that will happen. The board will be meeting again in August and again in October, so we'll have more information as to the duration of this. But as it, as it applies to Pennsylvania, uh, it, it applies to anything managed under Section 61.2, and it should be noted that it does not affect inland striped bass fisheries. It's only waters managed in the Delaware River, West Branch, Delaware River, and River Estuary. And it became effective uh, upon a temporary change to fishing regulations on June 3rd, and it's going to continue through the end of the year. The ASMSC mandate was only for 180 days, but to, to maintain regulatory uh, consistency and, and, and not make undo changes, our regulations, extend those ex temporary regs to the end of the year, which this was done, this will be done in this case. 
and it reduces the, the current 35 inch upper end of the harvestable slot to 31. And you can see the geographic extent to where this applies. All daily limit seasons and gear restrictions will remain the same. So in, in looking at the regulation chart in the regulation, the only change again will be from the, the 35 inches that you see in the upper and lower minimum size uh, rows will, will be changed to 31 inches. The daily limit and gear restrictions that are currently in place, that is circle hooks and the prohibition of the use of a gaff when fishing for Atlantic striped bass will also remain in effect. So with that, I could take any questions or comments on this emergency action. Thanks, Chris. Um, appreciate that presentation and uh, found it informative. Commissioners, uh, questions or comments for Chris? Hearing none, uh, Chris, I'll ask you then just to move up, uh, move ahead with us, your uh, wrap up of the um, voting items that will that you're planning the staff are planning to bring before the July quarterly commission meeting. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Lewis. So th this is the final item on the agenda for presentations, and it's just a brief overview of of the upcoming fisheries agenda items planned for the July 2023 commission meeting. Uh, we have. There are, well, there, there are seven voting items planned for July, and, and, and staff will, will provide full presentations pertaining to each of these items being proposed for consideration at the July meeting. So I'm just going to provide a, a high-level overview of the topics here. And some of these ones, uh, we've heard a lot more comprehensive discussions on already, the first being the final rulemaking item, and that is the amendments to uh, Chapter 71 and 73, essentially the 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 revision and, and creation of a, a new chapter 71A. So that was already covered in detail. I'm not gonna uh, repeat anything here uh, on that. Um, moving to proposed rulemaking. Again, this is another repeat item uh, that we plan to bring to the board uh, for proposed rulemaking at the, at the July meeting. And you just heard a, a detailed presentation from, from Dave, Dave Nyhart um, discussing the potential miscellaneous special regulation to apply to 12 of the 13 stock trout water class A sections that are managed with Commonwealth Inland Water Regulations. And so moving on, then next up is, is a, a, um, uh, uh, another proposed rulemaking that is amendments to uh, section 6526 extended trout season. And so this is this is more of a housekeeping matter in that it it it, it pertains to permits that are issued to private individuals or entities through our current regulations uh, to apply ex extended trout season regulations to waters that are not managed as stock trout waters. You may ask, well why would that be relevant? So it's, it's a program basically for a private landowner that or, or organization that may have a, a, a stream that's stocked for a private fishing club or whatnot to be able to stock that water and have their members harvest fish during the closed season. Uh, as Dave mentioned in a previous presentation, extended season regulations only apply to stock trout waters, and this would be for non-stock trout waters. And it's it's basically just to align the permit itself with the the new closure period. When I say new, the, the closure period that that begins uh, with the third Monday in February, essentially since we changed the, the, the opening day for the regular season for trout a couple of years ago. There'll be more detail provided on that at the at the upcoming commission meeting and also will be detailed in, in the agenda prior to. And so as far as designations, we have the, 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 the common proposed changes to the list of class A wild trout streams. We have five designations for those and nine designations for the classifications of wild trout streams. Specific to the class A, 
wild trout streams. Uh, none of those are stocked by the Fish and Boat Commission, a cooperative nursery, uh, and we're unaware of any special activities permits or DEP permits associated with those waters. Again, I said, mentioned there's nine classifications of wild trout streams, the, the proposed additions. And uh, again, uh, it, it should be noted here that this, this classification does not affect or the, the ability to continue stocking those, those waters. Finally, we, for, for designations, we have a, a uh, uh, removal of big bass regulations from Kale Lake and Clarion and Venango counties. And so this is, this is essentially working in concert with a recent ch temporary change to fishing regulations that was applied, and it's a standard approach that we take with waters that are uh, lakes that is, that, that, that is that are being drawn down for dam and spillway repairs. So in advance of, of a complete drawdown, we want to encourage anglers to uh, make good use of those fish prior to the lake being drained. So we lift all season sizes and krill limits uh, from those waters. And currently big bass regulations are applied to Kale Lake. This is just the removal of that like I say, in concert with the temporary change, and it facilitates a movement of that water into our catch and release lakes program once the lake is, is, is refilled and, and restocking begins. So is there any, well, we have one more um, item, and, and, and that's under other matters. It's, it's, it's the Valley Creek Watershed Restoration Grant to the Open Land Conservancy of Chester County for a stream restoration project on an unnamed tributary to Valley Creek in Chester County. Essentially, this is a, a grant program that we have uh, to, to provide funding to restore uh, stream and aquatic habitat in the Valley Creek watershed. And when grants are in excess of $100,000, it requires board approval and you'll be hearing a more detailed presentation on that by uh, Tyler Neiman at the July commission meeting. And with that, I'd be glad to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Chris. Um, do the commissioners have any questions or comments about these proposed uh, voting items? If not, uh, let's move on to the next uh, item, which is new business. Is there any new business or other business that a commissioner would like to bring forward to the committee at this time? Okay, hearing none, I'd like to remind all commissioners and others watching remotely that the next full quarterly meeting of the commission meeting will be conducted at the commission headquarters in Harrisburg on Monday, July 24th. Uh, I'll now ask uh, commission vice president, commission president, excuse me, BJ, Commission President BJ Small to offer any final comments he may have. BJ? Yeah, good discussion and very detailed. Um, I would like to thank all the commissioners who were on, got on here today, uh, even though you were not a member of this committee. It's important business and details that we're, that we're going to consider uh, next month. So I appreciate uh, you getting that information today and it gives us uh, some extra time to digest it. Again, and thank you, Richard, for, for uh, uh, conducting this meeting. Thank you again, staff, for all your hard work, all your details in, in making this happen. You're the best. Um, and we look forward to uh, seeing everybody then in July, if not before. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, BJ. Um, uh, normally, I'd call on Tim Schaefer, our executive director, to make a final comment, but he's told me that in essence of time, he'd prefer not to do that. But he also did express to me how much he appreciates the support that he receives and the commission receives from its anglers and boaters, and also how much support he receives uh, from his staff and their dedication to carrying out our mission of providing uh, the, the maximum fishing and boating opportunities uh, we have um, available in Pennsylvania for our residents. Um, I want to tell you that uh, I'm privileged to have served as the chair of this committee for the last year. This will probably be my last committee meeting that I chair because we'll be electing new officers at the July meeting and there'll be a rotation of, of officers and also likely new, new chairs for the various committees. 
Uh, so I've been uh, privileged. It's been an educational experience for me, and I've been privileged to serve in a capacity of leadership on statewide fisheries and, and hatcheries of issues and uh, activities and projects. I want to offer a special thanks to Chris Kuhn, um, the, uh, the director, uh, for his guidance. I'm a person who has a background in natural resources, but uh, that's in forestry. I'm a professional forester by original training, so I really did not have and do not have as much expertise in the area of fish biology and other things. And Chris has always been helpful and uh, very patient in filling me in on things that um, that he's very knowledgeable about. And it helps me serve better in a leadership position. Um, <clears throat> and, and also as, as one who's had career long responsibilities in planning and conducting meetings, I would also be remiss if I, I didn't uh, recognize and thank the commission staff who worked behind the scenes today to set up our virtual meeting and broadcast it to the public. Um, your work behind the scenes and making these virtual meetings work uh, effectively and correctly is, is very much appreciated by me and by your fellow commissioners. Uh, with that, uh, I declare this meeting of the Commission's ha Fisheries and Hatcheries Committee adjourned at 12.13 p.m. Um, have a good rest of the week, everybody, and be safe. Um, and if you're out boating, please wear your personal flotation device or life jacket um, and, and, and be safe. Thank you.